And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the upcoming dark, dark European fantasy known as Streets of Peril, the one and only Kyle Griswold. How are you doing tonight, man? Fabulous. Thank you for having me, sir. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for braving the hell that is time zones. <laughs> no worries. I'm glad to be here. Mm -hmm. So, a bit of a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Okay, well, my first introduction to role-playing games was I was in uh, junior high, and my friends and I had put together money to go and buy our first uh, role-playing book, which was Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition. Mm -hmm. And this would have been in the late 90s and possibly early 2000s. We got into a used bookstore. We bought a first edition copy of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I still own that book to this day. It's one of my favorite books. And um, we tried playing through it. Obviously, we had no friends who played any sort of role-playing games. There was At the time, there was no critical role or anything else where you could go and just look up how to, to role-play. And so we struggled through it as best we could. And mm -hmm. uh, going into high school, I... Uh, I ran into another circle of friends who were playing third edition Dungeons and Dragons. And through high school, I would go and drive about an hour away to another city and spend the weekend with, with my friends. And we would play third edition Dungeons and Dragons for an entire weekend, like eight hour sessions at a time. It was ridiculous. And it was really fun. One of the things that stuck with me was that a lot of the relationships that I built, um, with those guys stuck with a long time and we all kind of had uh, different life paths. Uh, some of some of my friends went to the military and we ended up uh, um, going to, to college later. Uh, and then um, some guys went to different professions, but it was one thing that was, it was really interesting was that despite all the different backgrounds and kind of where we ended up, we still had that one thing in common. Mm hmm. And then as far as um, what made it stick, um, I have always had a passion for, uh, and this is going to sound really weird, but uh, when I was a kid, my father, as, a, as sort of like a reward for good behavior, would take us to the, the local library. And one of my earliest childhood memories is, is going and finding uh, myth books on mythology mm -hmm. and just really, uh, you know, I mean, at the, before I could even really read that well, you know, seeing these books with like uh, illustrated versions of Greek mythology where you saw, um, you know, illustrations of the, of the Hydra and um, the Minotaur. And, and there's this kind of this, the, the medium of having text and illustration and putting together and weaving that together to create uh, and to um portray myth to me was something that always stayed with me for a long time. And uh, even so I, when I first got that first copy of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, I, it, it had brought back and uh, all of these old feelings that I had as a kid going through and looking at these, these old books. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I just, I love it. I, I just, I still this day, there's just something about, um, the medium that is role-playing books with again the the combination of illustration and text and putting those two things together uh to paint these really vivid um imaginative um scenes that i don't even think are necessarily captured in uh a animation or live action the same way mm -hmm. now it's in it's um interesting that you br that you bring up um, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition, 
and and then a, and then a bit of um D and D third D and D third edition with what well, with the eight out what well, with the eight hour runs which um. Geez, that almost seems like a that almost seems like a mythical event. <laughs> but now part part of the reason I part of the reason I say that's interesting is be is in part because of the mecha the mechanics I'm seeing with um with Streets of Peril, but also the f also the fact that 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 a lot a lot of times. When I've seen when I've seen somebody get into Warhammer Fantasy, they typically were aware of Warhammer from some other meet from some other medium, and it sounds like that wasn't the case. I don't. I get the feeling you weren't much of a um, you weren't much of a Warhammer um, fantasy battle player before that point. Incorrect. I oh. was. Oh. Okay. And I, <laughs> I stand corrected. This, but this is what's funny, and this is this is what's funny is when I first um, was introduced to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, I was extremely disappointed that a lot of the high fantasy elements, and I can't even remember which edition the tabletop was at the time, was not included. But then later, as I got older, I started to re recognize how awesome the setting really was in first edition fan Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay mm -hmm. and how I think the later editions, in fact, suffer from including the elements from the tabletop game. It's that's to be honest, that's one of that's one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of things. Sure. Um, where where if you ch where if they um if they try if they did if they didn't include some of that then the, then the fantasy battle people who would who would want to try and convert. Characters or armies from the uh, from the war game on onto, onto the role playing game would cry, would cry foul and and if they and if they did then the then the people who like the more who like the lower end of of the rung with it would would cry foul as well. Um, Correct. Although I will I will admit I do I do think that there's an interesting balance between the two with the whole tier setup that um, fourth edition has. Um. But even but even with even with that the th was was um was the creation of was the creation of streets of peril something that you had all that some that had been kicking around for for a while as as if um as in you were you were playing it around the table for quite a bit while it was unrefined or was the creation of streets of peril a little bit more of a recent affair. Um. Well, let's, uh, so starting back from the, where it originated, mm -hmm. um, we had I had not been role playing for a little while. Uh, I had started my profession and I had been kind of caught up with professional life for a while, and then I had a, an old acquaintance from high school reach out to me and uh, you know about five years ago and ask if I wanted to. Uh, DM, or I guess in this case it would be GM, for a uh, second edition Warhammer Fantasy role-playing game. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ran uh, The Enemy Within with second edition roles, and I fell in love with role-playing all over again. And as time went on, I started to get a, a more steady, permanent group of players, and we started doing 5th uh, edition, and 5th edition was great. And, um, but one of the things that I, as we started playing other, um, settings, we tried like, uh, dungeon crawl classics and a few others, uh, is that there was something about the, um, the kind of the gritty nature of Warhammer that I, I kept missing from other systems. Uh, but at the same time with Warhammer fantasy roleplay, I, I was never super impressed with the way that combat works. And I mean, it's the same issue that uh, any D100 system has. And I know that not all the, I think it was it uh, third edition had a, had a dice pull system, but I never mm -hmm. played that. But I know like for first, second, and I, I think fourth, because I, I have the fourth yeah. edition book, but I haven't played it yet. Fourth does, fourth does use a, D, a D100 system still. Right. Yeah, so the D100 system is interesting because what ends up happening, and that's this is kind of what we ran into when we when I started playing, picking it up again, is that uh, it's 
there's a, the perfect, there's a really nice place when this, this, all the stats are kind of leveling around 50 or 60 percentage of probability for success. But then on the, on the other extremes, like for example, a, a beginning character, you, you basically get all this, uh, you, you have combat and it's just whiffing, 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 whiffing. And then on the other extreme, once you start getting up into like the high 70s or 80s, mm -hmm. then it's always, it's constantly successes. And then on top of that, one of the, you know, when you start to do things like uh, the way that parries and dodges work, where the combat could just drag on forever. It would be, it'd be tons and tons of rolls. But I also really enjoyed one of the things I always really enjoyed about the aspect of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay versus, say, D and D, is that in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, from a narrative standpoint for the the GM, it's a little easier to articulate what's going on based on the die rolls. And by that I mean this: in a D twenty system like Dungeons and Dragons, your probability of being hit is tied to your armor class. But your armor class can mean a variety of different things. It can be how well you are, how skilled you are at parrying, how good you are at dodging. It could also mean literally what armor you're wearing. And a, a competent DM should have no problems being able to narrate what, what happens when a hit or a miss occurs. But one of the things I did enjoy quite a bit about Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay was that it was very, it's very easy to, to tell. When someone parries a strike, it's obvious what happens. They parry the strike. When they dodge it, they dodge it. And then... What effect armor plays in combat is also very obvious because it, uh, for lack of a better word, it's like DR and or damage reduction mm -hmm. in the third edition, right? So you, it, it, it reduces the amount of damage dealt. Um, but again, the problem I always had with the, with the D100 system and with more Warhammer Fantasy role playing generals is they could get really bogged down. It'd be it'd be tons of rolls. It'd be you know, you having to consult to see where, what part of the body was hit, what kind of armor was there. And it was just, it was never as fast paced or as fun, in my opinion, as, as like a D20 system. Oh, all right. That I can, I can definitely see that. And it, admittedly, um, there is a kind fourth edition, um, Warhammer fantasy has, has attempted to alleviate this with a, with a kind of momentum system that they're, that they're implementing. Oh. Right, I've seen that. Yeah, I have the book. I, 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 I haven't really tested it enough to see how much I like it, but I, I do appreciate the fact that they try to to address that issue. Yeah, and what I do something that I do find kind of interesting because you're using a D six pool system, a success based D six pool. Correct. And. What's interesting about that with how, with how you wrote with how you set it up and I I did um I was start I was starting to suspect that there was some Warhammer influence when you start when you referred to dice rolls as tests but the fact that five fives that um fours and above are successes and six and sixes are um exploding successes I know you wrote it as critical successes but um habit yeah absolutely it's exploding yeah but the the fun the reason I find that funny is so, is about a year ago I had Graham Davis on the on the show, um, one of the oh, co really? one, one of the co creators of Warhammer Fantasy, and he he talked about how in the in the original versions that they had planned they actually were going to use the exact same dice system that they used for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. However, oh. when they tested it, it didn't it didn't work as they had as they had planned, so they switched over to a D100 system. Now, That's interesting. I didn't know uh, that. Yeah. Now, what of all the diff and of course there's the fact that the um recently released um Wrath and Glory for um Warhammer 40,000 uses a D6 pool. I'm curious what prompted you to go with a D a go with a uh, success-based D6 pool. You know what? It's so, it's really actually kind of funny. I um, I wasn't going to originally. Originally, it was going to be a, a D20 based system. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to do, and I wasn't sure how to address it, but what I wanted to have was to a system where it felt like 
the defender had some agency in determining whether or not success happened. So um, that to me was really important. And originally the way that I was going to work out the D6 pull mechanic was going to be not with D6s, it was going to be with D10s. And it was going to be a, you roll a pull and whatever the highest die in the pull is, is what you, what is, is what you rolled as opposed to um, like, if like I said, it's an opposed roll, the other person rolls their pull of D10s and then the highest roll. And I know there's other systems that use that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I changed it to the way it is now with successes. And it's really funny because I've never actually played a, a dice pull system. So Later on, as I started looking into um, other games mechanics, I started to realize that uh, I had – there was nothing novel about my system. It actually, it was like tons of other games that have the same things. But in all honesty, it's really weird. It's like I, 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 I thought I had something unique. It turns out I don't. Um, yeah, and every, every Shadowrun player right now is laughing at you. Yeah, actually, in Shadowrun was the first one, and I've never played Shadowrun. I've never, I, I've never seen the mechanics for it. But Shadowrun is exact. Like, it's literally, it's almost exactly the same thing. The only, um, the only thing that I recognized early on when I was making this system versus, I, I, I think one of the differences with Shadowrun is, I didn't want uh, dice pools to get crazy with like rolling more than ten dice. Mm-hmm. And um, so the way I circumvented that was I came up with this idea of dice colors. So you could uh, represent uh, different levels of skill without just just throwing more dice into the pool. Given given that now whenever there's a couple there's a couple instances I can think of regarding um, regarding multicolored approaches to dice. Um, the one of the big one of the big ones for me growing up, of course, was the wild dice system in um, Star Wars D six and just the um, West End D six system as a whole. The uh, the um, the other one that I can think of is the dragon die that's in the um, Age system, but this particular approach of of multicolor, the way you have. Um, where you have white, red, and black dice is something I have is something I haven't seen often. And when it when when it comes to when it comes to it, the, there's a couple of questions I have to ask. One, um, what led you down to to uh, doing to doing this particular approach? And two, um, is the white, red, and red and black setup ki- kind of your way of um? demonstrating situational advantage and disadvantage? It could be. Um, the way that I, the reason why I came to this again is it goes to, it, like, for example, a lot of the combat is uh, opposed roles. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I didn't want to have happen is just an arms race of who could have the most dice. And I think that that's probably something that I would, and again, I haven't really played very many dice pool systems, but I think that's probably the goal, right? Is, is I want my pool to be bigger than yours, so I have more likelihood of success. Mm-hmm. Um, it, to me, I, I feel like that's it's a little clumsy. I don't, like, uh, I literally, when I was coming up with the system, I would sit down with D6 and I'd roll and see how many, like, how many, what, what kind of handful of dice actually felt comfortable? What point does, how many dice do I, can I fit in my hand to, to the point where it does not feel comfortable? And one of the things I decided early on was I really wanted to try to limit the amount of dice to 10. Um, and so a, a kind of above average roll should involve about six dice and a below average roll should be about two to three. And then 10 would anything even approaching 10 would be like, you were extraordinarily good at that ability. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I tried to do to get around it was a couple of different things. One is some abilities and traits would would reduce the number of dice the opponent would roll as opposed to you getting more. So instead of just adding more pull dice to your pull, you're, you're reducing the opponent's pull. Um, which for me as the GM, I mean, I, I prefer that because now it's like it's not me having to find more dice. It's easier. I think it's personally, I just I prefer to just remove dice. 
And then the other thing is this using these, this dice color mechanic is instead of me representing like uh, that the character is particularly good at sword fighting and then so for therefore he gets more dice, he just he gets a different color die which uh, succeeds more often than uh, an inferior die. Mm-hmm. And so again, it's just one more way of, of, of simulating why the proficiency in a certain skill without actually having to physically add more dice to the pool. So would would it be a, so in this in this regard, despite, no matter no matter what, would it be fair of me to say that most tests are strictly going to be using attributes? Yes, I would say that's correct. And sk- skills would just con- skills would just do a color conversion. Well, skills, so the way that attributes and skills are going to work is that it's, I mean, you brought up Shadowrun, and when I, it's it's exactly the same thing. I don't remember, I think they use a, instead of an attribute, I think they call it stats and skills. So in yeah. line, it's attributes and skills, and so that, that's what formulates your dice pool. So mm-hmm. your dice pool is your base attribute plus your skill, your ranks and skills, and you have ranks in both. Yeah. What, what indicates color is neither of those things. It's going to be based off of the the class traits special traits that you can uh that anyone can pick up uh through character advancement and certain uh, equipment will uh convey uh, a dice uh, increase as well Mm -hmm. so like uh, an example of this would be if a weapon has a brutal trait which would be things like long axes and halberds uh your damage uh, instead of rolling the standard white dice, which succeeds on a four, five, or six, you get to roll a three, four. You get to roll a red die, which succeeds on a three, four, five, or six. Um, that's an example of how the equipment could affect things. Uh, and as far as how the special traits can affect things, uh, you could acquire something a, a trait called weapon affinity, where you select one particular type of weapon. And when you attack with that one type, very specific type of weapon, you then also get to roll red dice. Um, so the skills themselves don't determine what kind of dice you roll. Like those, the, the attributes and skills literally are just for the amount of dice you roll. Which that def- that definitely makes sense. And given and given what you mentioned about um, classes, Ed, I do want to ask a bit on the on the. Set setup of cl- of classes and subclasses that you that you have. Now, obviously, since since we've both brought up um, the different versions of Warhammer Fantasy, we're we're both familiar with the um, tumbleweed that is the career system within the ge- within the game. <laughs> that um, that I I distinctly remember have. You know, you know the meme of you know the conspiracy guy meme where he's just where he's just got um, tags and and rope lines all over all over the place. Um, yeah, the word, that, yeah, the word, yeah. That I will freely admit that felt like me when it came to tr- when it came to trying to summarize all the different paths that can be taken when it came to careers. <laughs> yeah, careers are interesting. I I personally I I like careers i mm. think they're very charming but i know that there's lots of when I, especially when i get players before that have come from D and they go to play war in france real play it's kind of off putting for them yeah and admittedly some of some of that is the some of that is the ch- um goes with the charm of it but was was the was the D influence the reason why you only went with a handful of classes and subclasses for um streets of peril yeah, and, and also that I wanted to also set a different tone. So the the tone of Streets of Peril is somewhere in between Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay and D&D. And by that I mean in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, it's a, their take on Grimdark is you are uh, you start off as a peasant or a rat catcher or just basically someone who is not uh you don't start off as a hero you should start off as a normal person pursuing whatever career it is that you're pursuing Mm -hmm. and you get thrust into adventure most likely unwillingly and hopefully you succeed or survive long enough to sort of develop into um the uh 
maybe potentially even like the anti-hero that you eventually will be. But more, but most likely or not in Warhammer, you're going to go insane or you're going to die. It's kind of like a given that that's what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And then on the opposite end, in D&D, it's very high fantasy. It's the you're essentially a fantasy superhero. Um, the the tone that I wanted for the game is I didn't want I didn't want comic book superhero characters. So like no, I didn't want D and D characters. I also didn't want Lovecraftian protagonists, such as like Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, where uh, you're you're such a you're essentially going to die or come, succumb to insanity. It's just when it happens. It's very nihilistic. And what I wanted more along the lines of was a Robert E. Howard type hero, uh, Solomon Kane, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, obviously Conan, uh, Cole the Conqueror. I, I wanted characters who were in a dark, gritty world, but they are still heroes and they find ways to overcome the other. Uh, that's that's what I wanted. And so the, the classes, the way they're designed now is they, they have, like Warhammer, they have ties to the world all the classes including the subclasses have a direct cultural uh, connection to the world which is what i really wanted i didn't want this to be kind of an ambiguous setting with ambiguous classes that really meant nothing Uh, but on the other hand i also wanted to um, communicate to the players and to the gm that these are these are these are competent characters this isn't the rat catcher in the sewer this is this is the duelist who's received hours upon hours of training in his fencing cell. This is the man at arms who has potentially gone out and when fought in Lanskinek formations against enemy armies. Um, th- these are competent people. Mm-hmm. And to the, to that to that particular end. Now I now. I know in the document that you had sent me, it do- it doesn't go too much into um, advancement, but are you are you aiming for a t- a tier based or level based advancement, or are you aiming for something that is far that is far more free form? It's free form, and I and I I I sent you an updated one, and I and I regret I sent it so late, but the um, I finally got around to finishing up the campaigns chapter mm-hmm. or at least getting the meat and potatoes of it mm-hmm. and the, the plan for the whole system has always been a uh, experience is currency uh, way of advancement and for me that's that's always been something i wanted because I, I i've always liked that aspect of warhammer fantasy role play i like the idea that even if you were in a career uh you could still you still had decisions within that career about how you wanted to advance uh, within the limitations of what was offered. And um, one of the things I, I always really liked about Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, especially on the, on the standpoint of, you know, from a, as a player, is every game, or just about every game, uh, depends on what happens, but there's a fairly good chance that you're going to make some sort of advancement, so your character is constantly evolving, but they're small little incremental changes. Mm-hmm. Whereas in D and D, you may play several sessions before you see any change, but it's a it's a significant change, um, and that's one of the things with this system is that uh, it's experience is currency, and you can you have the option of saving experience to um, purchase a uh, more powerful upgrade, or you can uh, sort of be a jack of all trades and invest experience into uh, a variety of different skills and be fairly competent of a lot of different things. Which that definitely given, given that this, and this is where I'm, this is where I'm also curious. Um, now, even though something like something like Warhammer fantasy is fairly free form, it's, it's one of those cases where it's technically free form, but in, but but only, but only to a point, because each career has, as a um, has a available list of what of what you're gonna get a discount on on, um, advancements when it comes to skills, when it comes to talents, and so on. 
do you have something like that in mind when it comes to when it comes to your class system, or is it a, or is it a case where where um, once you've got your class, um, everything's on the table? Uh, mostly everything's on the table. The only exception is with um, the spellcasting classes, the cultists and the magister. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is an op. There's going to be, and I haven't quite articulated the rules yet and written them down. But one of the things I do want to have is that uh, characters that are not of the magister class could theoretically obtain and learn magic. They're just never going to be as competent as it. But what I so the way of having the classes still be distinct while allowing characters to branch out in a variety of different ways is that uh, classes are more defined by the very unique uh, traits that they get with their class and their subclass as opposed to just the raw ranks they start off in any skill. Mm-hmm. So um, by that, uh, you know, a man at arms, for example, he's he gets uh, he's fairly well rounded, and as far as his ability to fight melee, his ability to avoid attacks through parrying and dodges, um, using shooting, he's not exceptional in anyone, but he's very well rounded in everything. Um, and if he was if it was just if classes literally did nothing but just establish what your starting ranks were, then Essentially, but then theoretically, by the end of a campaign, characters that started in different classes would look I could theoretically look identical by the end. Mm-hmm. And that's not what I wanted. So, to so for one of the things that makes like uh, using the man in arms example, what it makes them unique is that they have these abilities that separates them from anything up from any other class, and they, which cannot be accessed by other classes. So, yeah. the man in arms has this tactics ability, which. Um, he communicates on the battlefield to give uh, other players uh, a, a boost, uh, a, you know, a, an advantage in, in the battlefield to 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 perform better. Um, not not one of the class can do that. He's the only class that can do that. He's also um, starts off with uh, he's always going to be better at wearing armor than everyone else because um, he has more experience being out in the field. Um, going out and doing drills in armor. He's always just going to be better at wearing armor than the average um, Cimbrian citizen that has to only wear armor maybe once a month when they have to do the mandatory patrol. Mm-hmm. And when it and um, when it comes to, I know that there's the whole thing with um su- with sub with subclasses, but. Sometimes I've seen subclasses as a, as a, as a more advanced version that somebody can go into, but if I'm not mistaken, the um, approach that you have is that sub is that subclasses are something that you're going to be starting out with. Correct, and the subclasses. So the goal of subclasses was to offer more of a direct link to the lore of the setting as opposed mm-hmm. to some sort of mechanical advantage. There are now every subclass offers one additional unique trait, um, which, you know, there's your abilities that you would not ordinarily get. But mm-hmm. the main goal of having subclasses was that um, the player would feel more connected to the world through the subclasses. And all the subclasses are designed to have um, a direct tie in and connection to the setting. Yep. Now, when it com- when it comes to getting back to the whole advancement thing, um, I could easily see XP being spent on um, on skills and on um, attributes. But do you have some equivalent to ta- to talents that um, that characters can spend XP on? Yes. Um, so when you get experience, there's essentially um, these are the options you can have. Right now, and this may be modified, but I, I kind of doubt it will be. Attributes, your your base attributes, the ranks you get will not change. It's not. Uh, I'm kind of going for more of like a early D and D thing where uh, you roll your stats and those are your stats. Uh, maybe equipment. Like certain things can happen um, where you may quest for something, a magical elixir that raises your stats, or you get an item that raises your stats. But otherwise, they're going to stay the same. And, 
and I, I'm, I'm giving kind of like a D and D example. It's a little higher fantasy than what I expect to happen in this uh, game, but for the most part, stats should stay the same. Skills are where um, characters are dynamic. They mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what your natural uh, proclivities may be. Um, you you always have the ability to work hard and learn and become better at some other thing. And that's where skills, so skills will have the, that ability to be advanced. On top of that, um, there are these, um, there's something called special traits. So special traits are traits that are not linked to your lineage and they're not linked to your class. Uh, and everyone has access to the same special traits. Every character starts off with one special trait and experience allows you to buy more and special traits are where that's in this the mechanics of the game special traits are where characters start to take on uh, mechanical identities that differentiate themselves from others and and i was actually i was a little and they're very close to the way talents work mm-hmm. in warhammer fantasy roleplay but I, I wanted to be very careful with it because um anyone who's played Third edition 3.5 remembers like and I and I, I played a little briefly Pathfinder first edition for just a little bit, but the know, traps. Feats could, yeah, feats feats could get out of hand. You know, feats could get out of hand, and you'd have to have like you would have to have uh, one feat in order to get another one, and you'd like start like you'd have to plan out like which feats you need in advance, and then you'd buy like new books because that new book would have the be- the best feats, and you'd have so you know like hi whirlwind just, attack. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah feats feats could get i mean feats could get silly I, the way that the special traits work in this uh in these mechanics is that special traits um they're they're not i don't think there's any one special trait in the book and there's, there's quite a few i'd have to count them, but I, I would assume there's probably at least 50 there there's no one special trait that you look at and you go oh i have to have that one. uh in fact so far in play testing um, the, the main feedback I've heard so far is there's too many, there's, I can't decide which one I want, which is good because I, I when I'm a player, I am sort of, a, uh, I, I'm, I'm very crunchy. I, I kind of want to, you know, min max and I want to build the, the best character I can. So I really did not want to have, uh, a go-to for how characters should be built in the system. I want everything. I want you to sort of be able to pick and choose the flavor of special traits that define the character and how they, they function without making it so that there's a, a sort of default mandatory thing you have to do. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, so you can raise skills and you can rate, you can acquire special traits. And then on top of that, uh, you can also, if you're, for example, if you're a cultist or a magister, you can learn new spells or miracles. Um, the scientist can use experience to, uh, produce more inventions and experience can also be used to learn new languages. And that's where I'm at right now, as far as how to use experience as currency. Mm-hmm. Now in a lot, in a lot of games, especially games that are outside the D 20 bubble, there often tends to be some sort of extra effort mechanic. Um, Shadowrun has edge. Um, World of Darkness has Willpower. Um, Eclipse Phase has Moxie. Warhammer, Fan- Warhammer Fantasy and Warhammer 40k roleplay have um, Fortune. Or, or in, some, in some cases, um, Fate. Um, do, you plan on ha- do you plan on having some, some sort of extra effort mechanic within um, Streets of Peril, or, does that, or would that just not fit? It could fit, and um, a writ soul. There's um, there's six there's six attributes. Uh, one of them is fate, and originally the way I had designed fate to be was was going to be uh, fairly similar to the way that it works in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Uh, but I, as I started to write the rules out more and more, I decided that I wanted to lean against that. I, I originally, it was going to be, and, and I might revisit it, but I, I kind of doubt it because I put other mechanics in place to replace it so originally it was going to be that uh the fate score would be would translate to a pool of extra dice that you could use um 
uh, throughout an encounter, like a combat encounter or whatever. Uh, and then once you exhausted those, they were gone for the encounter. Mm -hmm. I might go back to that, but I probably won't only because, um, what ended up happening is like, I came up with, uh, traits, which have, uh, a, a function that is, uh, limited to the uh, governing attribute for it. So for example, if you get the, um, uh, the faint trait, special trait, uh, you can a number of times uh, per encounter uh, equal to your intelligence rank, which is either going to be one through four, you can impose a penalty on an opponent's defense when you attack them in melee. Um, you're going to have a variety of different things similar to this, where you kind of have certain uh, special traits which have limited use. Um, and that's going to be sort of how you dictate, that's going to be the resource that you manage as opposed to like fortune points in Warhammer fantasy Roleplay, which is your sole resource that you manage. Mm -hmm. And now the, now, um, since we've kind of danced around it a bit, let, let's, um, let's dive head first into it as if, as if I'm, do, as if I'm going off of the high dive. Don't cannonball off of the high dive. It doesn't end well. <laughs> um, but let's talk a bit about the combat system that you're going with. Now, I'll get one of the easier questions out of out of the way first. Do you will the combat system for Streets of Peril have a hit location mechanic? No. All right. Um, given given how um, it's given how much uh, given how much Warhammer Fantasy was an inspiration, I'm cu I'm curious as to why and are you going with the more traditional health slash wound approach? The the biggest reason why and I and by the way I I for me I like the hit location for Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, but um, the, one of the goals for this system was. Fast combat, that was fun. Mm -hmm. um, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is not fast. Uh, looking up, asking the players, what what what, hit, what, uh, what was the reverse of your dice to tell me what your hit location is? Okay. Uh, what armor do you have at that location? Okay. Um, all right, I hit, I rolled, you know, there's a lot of things about Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay that's ending with fast. You know, critical hits are one of the, like, first edition's critical hits are the, the most fun thing about that system. They're so descriptive and over the top. But it does. It's time consuming that every time you know you, you you reduce a creature to zero hit points, you're rolling critical hits. You got to go to the chart, roll on the chart. It's fun, but it's slow, and that's one of the things I did not want to do. I want combat to be fast and fun. Um, and I'm sorry. What was the other part of this? Um, whether or not you'd be using a more traditional um, hit point approach, or or how would how would hit points vary in your system? So hit points, yeah, I, I think um, they're fairly similar to how I would assume that most uh, role-playing games do it. Uh, I call them grit points because, you know, one of the things in uh, that I wanted to avoid, because I am very explicit in the book about what grit points represent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the, the time-old arguments is what is a hit point in D&D? &D? Like, is it how much physical damage you're doing? Is it how lucky you are? Um, grit points are explicitly laid out as it's, your it's how mentally tough you are in the fight it's how it's how physically you know how much physical endurance you can deal it's just a, it's like how lucky you are with avoiding the cut just at the right time um they function a lot like wounds do in warhammer fantasy role player hit points do in D, &D. um yeah I, I i originally what i wanted to do was have a variety of different um like hit point varieties that can be targeted by different things. But then again, what ended up happening was I realized it's just slow. It's bogging it down. It's making it, it's not making it as fast as I want it to be. Which definitely makes, definitely makes sense. Um, I was, I was guessing it was going to be either that, or you're going to be using some sort of um, hit points and wounds set and wounds set up. Like say, um, like say fantasy craft or even the or even the wound variant in unearthed arcana back in third edition hmm. yeah no i i didn't i i um 
Yeah, and, and it's interesting because one of the, the systems that I like that have a kind of unique take on it is um, Savage Worlds. I've only mm-hmm. played it a little bit, but I know it's like as you as you take damage, your abilities uh, depreciate as well. Yeah. Um, and that was also one thing I wanted to explore. And again, it just it, it's one of those things that from a game design standpoint, it's not that something's right or wrong. It's just I had a goal in mind. And in order to meet the goal that I set out for me, I, I tried to cater the rules accordingly. All right, that, ma- that makes sense. Now, you had mentioned earlier that you wanted the defender to have agency when it came to um, combat encounters. Could you go into exactly what you meant by that? Yeah, so uh, going back to the D20 system, uh, the example is... There's uh, AC is a is essentially a target number, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the the offender rolls their d20 and their target number for that roll is whatever the target's AC is. Um, and then assuming they hit, they roll damage dice, and throughout the entire uh, uh, that entire in, encounter or um, that action, the defender doesn't do anything. It just they they just accept whatever outcomes. Uh, happen. Uh, and in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, uh, you roll a D100 to um, meet or uh, be lower than your weapon or ballistic skill or shooting skill. Uh, and if you hit, then the defender has the agency of determining whether or not they can use a parry or a dodge, depending on their ability to do so, because there's some nuance to that Mm -hmm. and then that's their agency right if they succeed on that then uh they dodge it or they parry it um but again uh depending on how you run it that could it to me that sometimes it could be a little slow unless you know like you run it like the way that streets apparel does it where you you roll things simultaneously um and the difference in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, though, is you only have so many dodges and parries. You only have one each round. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the player is going to roll simultaneously because they may wait to see if the person even hits. I mean, there's ways to get around it. But um, in this system, the way that the players have agency is that your ability to um, uh, dodge and attacks is directly related to your defense skill. And so when an opponent attacks you, uh, they roll their pull of d6, and you roll your pull of d6. Um, and as long as the defender uh, meets or exceeds the attack, the attacker's amount of successes, then the attack fails. Uh, so that's the first part of what provides the defender some agency. And then on top of that, if the attack hits, then the the kind of armor that the defender is wearing uh, does come into play as well. Now there is certain there's a kind of relationship there between the weapon being used and the armor being worn because some weapons bypass or um, entirely or partially different types of armor. So mm-hmm. then, uh, so so I'll give you an example of a kind of a way to count on a counter. So the attacker rolls his successes, defender rolls his his successes for uh, attack roll versus a defense roll. Assuming the attacker wins, let's say that the, defend, the attacker rolled five successes and the defender rolls three successes. So the total success value, for the net successes that the attacker has is two. So he adds those two successes right to his damage pool. He gets those to, add, to roll to his damage roll. On top of that, he ends to, depending on if it's shooting or melee, he gets more damage dice. So like in melee, your might attribute is is directly related to how many dice you get to roll. The weapon, the melee weapon you use may offer you as more uh, damage dice as well, as opposed to a ranged weapon, which has a fixed number of damage dice that you roll on top of whatever success value you had when you rolled your attack roll. Um, you roll your, your damage dice, and the defender gets to roll armor dice. That's determined by whatever armor they're wearing. The only time that this the amount of armor dice are rolled is modified is when certain weapons are being used. So like a halberd is better at um, defeating armor than a club. So you you would roll one less armor dice. Um, a musket, which in this setting is a relatively advanced piece of technology as opposed to like an arquebus, 
uh, completely nullifies armor unless you're wearing uh, field play, which is or like a, a, a very advanced piece of armor. Uh, so then, so it, I kind of I mean sort of verbose in it, mm-hmm. but to really simply break it down, it's one dice pull versus another, what first attack versus defense, and that just simulates whether or not the weapon actually hits. And then assuming the hit, the weapon does hit, then it's the amount of damage rolled versus the the armor pull that is rolled, and if and if every armor value roll that is a success nullifies one success that's rolled on the damage roll. So theoretically. Um, particularly characters that are wearing heavy armor, even if they do get hit, they could uh, completely nullify any damage done to them. And when given given all that, the other the other question I had was in regard to the action economy. Now, di- now um, some games do the do the whole thing of you can either take a full action or two half actions. Some have the attitude of a of different tiers of action. Um, D and D and D especially has this whole thing where where I had to ask the age old question: Okay, what's the difference between a swift and a free action? <laughs> <laughs> and how and what and why am I provoking attack of attacks of opportunity? Um, wh- what sort and sometimes you have cases that'll do just a straight amount of action points. Um, what approach are you taking with Streets of Peril? I'll be honest. I'm not even going to uh, tippy-toe around it. I was, I've, one of the things I really, really liked about 5th edition was the action, the way the action economy works. I think it's, mm-hmm. it's simple, but um, it offers enough nuance to make it still fun. Um, I know like in 2nd edition Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, there are certain aspects of two half actions versus one full action that is sort of annoying. So like players will not charge in second edition because if they, ch- if they charge, it takes half an action and therefore they can only take one attack. They can't use swift attack. So then they get less attack. So they just stand still and wait for the enemies to come. Um, and so combat always resolves the same. It's players sitting down waiting for the enemies to attack so that they can get their full swift action. Um, and then when it comes to like action points, I, I've seen similar. I, I haven't played, and, and I, this is one of the things I have to be very careful when I say this because uh, I could be ignorant on the subject because I haven't actually played it. And so maybe it plays out better than than the way that I've read it. But um, I know that looking at, I think Pathfinder Second Edition has a, is, is sort of like an action uh, point system where like you can do. You have like so many points, and you can do different things with them. Moving. You've got attacking. you've got three. You've effectively got three actions you can do. Some, and every action will li- will list out its cost. Um, right. Some require one. Some require two. Some require all three. Um, typic- typically, you're typically you're going to have a um. You're typically going to have a two and one with a lot with a lot of ca- with a lot of cases, um, mm-hmm. and mo- and. A attack is only an attack is only going to cost one point, but subsequent but subsequent attacks after that are going to incur penalties. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, and I and I, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I think um, I think action points uh, work can work really well. I think so. It's, it's, you know, it can be fine. And, I'm, and this is kind of me being a, a fence sitter on this, but mm-hmm. um, I personally, I just I really liked. Uh, the the sort of simplicity of 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 the combat in fifth edition and as far as you you always get a move so much and so Mm -hmm. streets of perils the same way you get you get so much movement every turn yeah um you always have one action uh the actions are are not so dissimilar to every other role-playing game you've ever played as to what constant when you play a game that you only have one action and then i basically stole bonus action from fifth edition i have auxiliary action um, which is uh, just like the name sounds, auxiliary action is something that um, uh, supplements and supports another action you're doing. Um, and there, there's not a whole lot of them. I don't. It's there's, you know, like part of the the meta of fifth fifth edition is sort of figuring out like how to uh, to get as many actions as you can. So you, you want to be able to get one at least one action, one bonus action. You want to try to get your uh, reaction as often as you can mm-hmm. uh, for action economy. Um, 
that's not so much here. Again, I, my goal was really to make things simple and fun. So not having movement tied into the action pool makes it so that it encourages movement. Mm -hmm. um, not having, you know, like for example, one of the things I did is there's no disengage action like you would see in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay or um, D and D or a lot of other games where basically once you're in base contact and you want to leave someone's reach, you have to take an action to get out. Instead, in this game, you roll an opposed agility test. And some traits in some classes will offer you so that they have an easier time um, leaving the, the threatening range of a melee weapon without getting hit. But you don't have to take an action to do that. It's, it's a choice that you make with a certain risk involved. And, and I like that because I want players to feel like they should be encouraged to move. There should be sort of uh, the bat fighting should be dynamic and encouraged. And then on top of that, um, you know, auxiliary actions are just, they're literally, they only exist so that if players have access to so many special traits or so many abilities, it's not getting silly with them running. Like I'm going to do 10 things this turn. You know, it's just the auxiliary actions is just, it's a, it's a, it's something to prevent combat from devolving into just something silly and people because you know i i'm building this whole system from the ground up and i even though i've been play testing it very thoroughly i mm -hmm. guarantee you there's some there's people are going to find ways to sort of break the system oh yeah uh, that's uh, that's yeah a case of it. It, that's a matter of when not if right you can't avoid it so i'm using i'm, I'm just doing you know what i can to sort of keep things as fun, fluid, simple, um, but also uh, not letting things get out of control is to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. Now, one, now um, obviously you're, go you're shooting for a um, sword and sorcery, low magic approach with, st with Streets of Peril, espe especially, and, um, especially given Given the given the uh, setting that you have it written, written out in which um I um I've kind of danced around co covering the setting for the, for this because I uh, don't I don't want to give too much in the way of um, spoilers on that front. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I do want to touch on is um magic. Um, and that. Now, with a lot of with a lot of low fan with a lot of low fantasy games, obviously magic can exist, but it's one of those things that people are going to either look at you sideways or or get out the port torches and pitchforks, depending on what city you're in, regarding how magic is treated and how magic is used mechanically. Um, what approach do, what approach mechanically does Streets of Peril have when it comes to magic and its use? Is it a case oh. of a skill? Is it a case of a um, finite pool? Is it a little of both? How is it working out? So from a raw mechanic standpoint, um, if you were to think of, let's assume that there's just two magic classes because it's, it's closer to three, but let's mm -hmm. say there's just two. There's the cultist and the um, magister. One's divine in the very arch archetypical sense of D&D. &D, one's the divine magic user and one's an arcane magic user um those two just looking at those two function mechanically very differently so in both cases there's not the um, i can always I forget, is it the vantian 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 uh, system vantian mm -hmm. uh which is like it's like jack vance's uh inspired right um, yeah so the, the, the it's not Vantian, so it's not like you have spell slots and you have so many that you can so many spells you can cast in a day, and you kind of assign where you want your how what spells you're going to take, and you can use them a limited amount. As as far as arcane magic goes, you can cast arcane magic as much as you want. What limits it is that arcane magic, uh, particularly when you're trying to cast it on the fly. Uh, is very dangerous because there's always a risk that you incur a chaotic manifestation. Basically what that is, um, without getting, I don't want to bore the listeners with too much of the lore, but like the, anytime you're manipulating this, this raw magical energy, there's always a chance that you, uh, you clumsily create these manifestations, which are very dangerous for the caster. Uh, and it's not, so far, what we've seen in playtests is that, like, if you really 
you want to pour uh, your dice pool into a spell to try to make it work on the fly without slowing down and focusing on it and trying to be safe with it, it's not improbable that your character can have really terrible things, including uh, imploding, happen to them. Um, so characters can slow down. They can try to focus on spells in combat, uh, which uh, obviously uh, decreases the, the speed at which they can cast a spell in combat, but prevents the likelihood of dangerous manifestations from happening. Or they can really gamble, and they can go all out, and they can try to dump um, their de- uh, pull into a spell, um, try to make it happen quick, and then sort of just let uh, the chips fall where they may. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's how arcane magic is balanced. It's uh, the 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 magister themselves gets to decide how much risk they want to take, and it's limited by their skill, of course. I mean, so um, uh, you still have to uh, develop a, a certain level of uh, proficiency in the magic skill before you're able to to dump a huge dice pool in, but. There's other ways that the magisters can circumvent that because like one of their special traits is called blood magic and they can actually damage themselves to get a bonus, which can then spiral. You can get a death spiral there because let's say you're not doing anything to control the focus of the magic and you're doing using blood magic and then you get a really dire consequence as a result of a chaos and manifestation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the character can instantly kill themselves without too much tr- trouble. But on the other end, if they're successful, they can they can produce some relatively powerful effects on the battlefield. Um, divine magic differs in that you um, you start off with, um, let's say, a starting cultist probably has uh, a dice pull of about four dice. And the first time you cast a miracle in the die, the difficulty value, which is the target number, is one. You only have to roll one success. No matter what miracle it is, and all and the miracles are balanced in such a way that um, they're all of relatively about the same power level. Um, so the first time you cast a miracle in a day, it's, it's relatively easy. You only have to roll one success on four dice, assuming that's what your pull is. Um, but every time throughout the day that you cast another miracle the difficulty value goes up by one. Mm-hmm. And what that is is, to, is uh, simulating is um, your deity, you're trying your deity's patience or your patron's patience. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he, he's bestowing you, he's granting you this uh, magical ability, but he's not expecting you to use him as a crutch. Like you're supposed to be a competent um, servant of him, not just basically using him as a wellspring of magic. Um, and so, and then once you fail a miracle in the day, you can't cast any more miracles until you fast, meditate, and pray for the night, and then you miracles, you can start resuming miracles the next day. So, uh, mechanically speaking, those two are very different from one another. And it's, it's one of the, it's like, it's, it's one of the things I wanted to do is that in like fifth edition or or D&D in general, Mm -hmm. There's not really much mechanically that separates divine magic from arcane magic. In Streets of Peril, the two feel differently, and I, I'm hoping that the reason why they feel differently uh, is uh, is intuitively connected to the lore of why they work the way they do. Yeah, and something that, something that I did note that I did notice is when it came to the when it came to the spell list is the is the fact that you um. With some with something like D with something like D and D and Warhammer, they they um segment spells between set between different um categories. D and D has the spheres, you know, evocation, enchantment, divination, etc. And um D and D and um not D and D Warhammer has the has the different winds. Mm-hmm. Even though even though of course there's exceptions to those rule, and then you've got the goddamn elves who apparently can use all the winds because fucking elves. I don't like elves. Have I made that clear? <laughs> I, you know what? You're a, you're in good company, brother. Because I don't like elves either. Um. But what I see here is a, is a more sh- is a more shared approach, and I'm I'm guessing part of that is is lore to the fact that there that there isn't really a established school system when it comes to magic users but also the also not wanting to pigeonhole people yeah there's there's yeah you you, you 
got it pretty well there. Um, there's two pro, there's two things. One there's a lore reason, and then mm-hmm. there's a mechanical reason. Yeah. Um, mechanically speaking, you're right. Um, the the magister already has enough problem. Like a dis- the disadvantage of being a magister is that your magic system is inherently dangerous. The cultist, you know, the worst thing that can happen to them is they just can't cast any more miracles for the day. The scientist and their arcane inventions never had risks any sort of uh, like safety concerns. The magister is is always, always going to be governed by the fact that there is an inherent risk in casting spells. And there's certain things you can do to mitigate that. But at the end of the day, there's always going to be that inherent risk. So I, I, from a mechanical standpoint, I wanted arcane spells to feel diverse. Um, and I wanted them to be able to feel like there was a lot of different things you can do as a magister. And that's one of the mechanical advantages. Mm-hmm. From a lore standpoint, I really tried very hard to look at uh, medieval and early Renaissance European magic spells um, that I could find in is that were preserved as maybe not like a literal incantation, but the sorts of magic that you would have perhaps seen um, or believe that, that they believe could have been performed as examples of spells that were performed. So for example, one of the spells that I took is literally from um, it. There's a fencing manual, a HEMA fencing manual called the 3227A. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a house book. It's not just fencing. It's a bunch of different things, including uh, magic. And one of the spells is um, summoning an army of knights uh, to come and protect you. And there's a spell in, in Streets of Peril, which does something very similar, where you, you summon a spectral knight uh, to assist you on the battlefield. Um, a lot of other things, a lot of other spells in there are also directly related, right down to the material component. Um, using uh, glass beads and certain types of um, stones to detect poison in in a substance. Uh, I, I wanted, I wanted, I also have a lot of little Easter eggs in there for people who um, have uh, historical knowledge of different types of things. And one of those things, like uh, my wife is really interested in um, kind of like esoteric medieval practices and so I, mm-hmm. i've been consulting her for a lot of stuff and you know like one of the things i did when i was commissioning art for the book was there's a one of the in the bestiary there's a fake creature uh, a hag and my wife was like well you need to give her six fingers because that was a common uh, myth is that pe- people with six fingers were that was the, a, was a witch mark and so that was one of the things that i, I put in there and, and again it doesn't explicitly say that but if you're familiar with those kinds of lures and that's includes in the beast and everything. And that's a lot of the, the setting is that way I've, I've borrowed or been inspired by a lot of history and mythology. Uh, and I, I really want that to come through in the setting. And I, and that's, de- that's definitely something that I'm, that I'm seeing. And I, and I will freely admit that the, um, the style of art, the style of art definitely helps. Um, now I I know you meant I know you mentioned that you had tr- that you had tried um doing a doing a Kickstarter and that and that and that didn't um pan out at the, pan out at the time but and given the given the fact that this is going to be something that's in that's in re- that's in relative flux I'm curious what you have planned for the for the coming months regarding um Streets of Peril. Yeah, so the it's funny the um, the the Kickstarter fell, but it ended up being a boon because I, I had intentionally uh, originally intended for this to be a fifth edition supplement, um, and then after gone through the lore and working through it, I realized that a lot of the mechanics in D and D fifth edition really would not support the sort of game that I wanted. And when the but then I almost felt compelled that if the Kickstarter succeeded, I would have to go through it. So it was a really kind of a weird blessing in disguise that it didn't work out because then I could go back to the drawing board and come up with my own unique setting, which was very daunting, but I'm, I'm glad I did. Mm-hmm. As far as like what the progress is now, um, I decided I'm, I'm not going to do a Kickstarter at all this time. I, I put an undisclosed a lot of money into 
the art. Um, the arts come a, lo a really long way, and that's really what the Kickstarter originally was going to be for. Was because when I when I put this out here, um, I talked about earlier about how I have a certain love for this the the medium of RPG books, and, and I really feel like it's not just the the written word that's important. It's also the relationship between the text and the images, and I really wanted art um, that. Um, uh, works really well with the text. And so I found uh, uh, two artists in particular who have been just absolutely phenomenal, but the professionals, I mean, it's their, it's their job and I, and you know, it's cost money to, to pay, to pay for good art. So I'm paying for all that out of pocket. A lot of the art has been, is done so far. I, I think, um, I think the BC area is going to be wrapped up in a couple months. I think uh, a lot of the other art, you know, the, all the class artwork is done. The first, I think, three or four chapters, I think all the pages are now illustrated. Um, so artwork is coming along as fast as my artist can do it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, layout, I've been doing, I taught myself how to do all the layout using InDesign. That was, at first it was sort of daunting. I didn't think I was going to do it because it was, but then the more I've been doing it, I've, I've really, uh, I've been learning a lot and I keep getting better at it. And so uh, I, I keep, so on my end, as much as I can do is just, I keep, I'm working on the chapters, the writing the text out. I'm working on the layout. Sometimes I understand a lot now about why these books have, you know, are a project of different people because it's easy to get bogged down in any one thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll, I'll spend one day where I'm like, I'm going to work on this chapter. I'm going to knock out a lot of text, uh, but then I'll spend hours, um, tweaking layout um which which i'm trying like at this point right now I'm, I'm really trying to focus on okay i can always come back to layout i can always make adjustments to layout um i can always go back and do editing i'm i mean i'm, I'm going to get an editor at the end of the day anyway so i don't know why i spend so much time uh, going back and trying to look for little things here when i'm going to pay someone to do it um and i'm just i'm right now the goal is to just knock out the last few chapters uh, which is not much in fact i just realized this this week i was just thinking to myself that um the book really is very close to being done and it's 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 exciting but it's almost like it's been a it's been a, you know quite a long journey so far and it's kind of scary because you don't know how it's going to turn out success wise when it's done uh, all right and give now, um, what would you estimate the total page count is going to be? I think it's going to be a minimum of 130 and probably a maximum of 160. And um, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that you plan on putting the usual fare when it comes to net, when it comes to help with navigation, namely namely an index and possibly um, bookmarks. Yeah, um, I'm going to do a uh, table of contents and index. I want to try to, you know, you, I, it's funny. I As I go and I'm looking at other people reviewing RPG books, especially indie RPG books, I try to see, like, what are the biggest criticisms. One of the things, like, uh, I was reading a review recently where it was like, I'm, I'm not even going to give a good review unless it has an index. So, um, yeah, that, that's something I definitely do intend to include. Mm-hmm. And I will most certainly be looking forward to seeing how it sh how it shakes out. With all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. Yeah, it was great fun. I, I uh, like I said, I really really appreciate you having me. It was mm -hmm. I had a good time. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Very good. I, well, hopefully I'll be back sometime soon. Maybe when it's all done, I'll come back. Yep. And and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!